professional officer in um, the Northern Ireland Practice and Education Council for Nursing and Midwifery. Um, Ursula, my colleague uh, today, um, is working with me in the delegation framework as well, so we're both really glad to be here. I know many of you, I don't know all of you, but I know many of you, and many of you I've known for a long time, so it's great to be amongst friends. Um, thank you, Donna and Bob, for the invitation to talk about the delegation framework. And this is something that we have been working on for a number of years and indeed uh, Bob is now involved in the next uh, part of the delegation framework and I'm going to talk a little bit about it at the very start of the presentation. So how much time have we got Donna and Wait, Bob? About 20 minutes or is that enough? 20 minutes? Okay. Uh, all right, okay. So, well, um, I might talk for 20 minutes but I, I imagine there will be questions afterwards. Um, yeah, thank you, Joe. A total of around about for now, I would say, five minutes to land, please. Okay. Right, so, uh, resting next slide, please. Um, I suppose whenever we started this work, um, it was very much with a view that the person in our care, uh, the patient, client, individual, child, family, carer, whoever you want to put behind that phrase, was the most important person to think about. We knew that services were beginning to be much more integrated and wrap around and that there were problems around the interfaces of care, but the most important thing was that we didn't have an individual who had three or four different people coming into their house every day to do a range of things that were aligned with a number of professions and because they were working very much in a silo mentality, it meant that there, there was this constant stream of individuals. So we, we knew that the most important thing was that we had to wrap our services around the best interests of the, per the people that we were caring for. So that's a starting position. Um, the slide that's on the screen there uh, for you is, talks about the purpose of delegation. And we know and understand that at the heart of providing person-centred and person-focused care. It is the opportunity to use the people that we work with on a day and daily basis to the best of our ability in terms of ensuring that the right skills are in the right place at the right time, doing the right things. And that isn't always necessary to be a registered professional. Um, and so it's about using our best understanding of how skill mix works in practice. In practice. And, um, and that, of course, to achieve person-centred outcomes. So, next slide, please, Justin. I'm going to do the boring bit now. Um, that how did we do this? And what is important around this? And what I want you maybe to take as a, as a key message from this, uh, a very quick race through how we got to where we are, is that at every stage we engaged with people across services in order to get their opinion and to feed into what we were doing to consult with how it was working and to test so that you can be assured that the framework and I've brought a full box of the hard copy frameworks with me this morning for you all to take away um, so that you can be assured that that framework is the best outcome that we can make it for all of you because we have consulted and engaged with everybody. It began in 2015 uh, with Dr. Glynis Henry at the CEC and she was being asked to undertake a range of training for band two and band three staff uh, across services, not just within nursing, uh, to undertake complex tasks that would have typically been tasks or duties that nurses um, or midwives or other registered professionals would have done. So she approached the chief nurse at the time and, and really escalated the concern around what she was been asked to deliver. And that then triggered uh, the whole um, plethora of events that have led us to where we are today, which is a regional framework in Northern Ireland that is mandated for use by the Chief Nursing Officer and the Executive Directors of Nursing and Senior Nursing Leadership in Northern Ireland. And the growth of that project I could go into in detail, I'm not going to bore you with it completely right now, but just to say that um, that scoping exercise that Glynis undertook back in 2015, and it was actually Morris Devine, my colleague Morris Devine led that uh, scoping exercise, who's no stranger to all of you, I know. Um, so that scoping exercise led to really um, an opening of Pandora's box and an understanding there were lots of things happening um, and there were some worries around what was happening 
and that then went on to a regional workshop which led to a pause and a bit of head scratching around what we should do and then I was asked to take over the work in 2016. I looked at the evidence and brought the broad bones of a framework and it's not actually very much changed from what we originally had placed before a workshop with individuals in 2016 in October. And as a result of um, what was a, a regional workshop in 2016, we then brought that back and went through various iterations and consulted very heavily with a number of, uh, with a very big task and finish group to actually get the work over the line. And part of the role of the task and finish group was to take it out into service environments and test how the framework worked in practice and then make the small tweaks and changes to it that we needed to make sure that it was actually fit for purpose and that it would work in practice areas. So next slide, Resty, please. Um, before I start uh, running you through what's in the framework, I want to start at the end, really, of where we got. Um, whenever I first started to do these awareness sessions, uh, one of the things that became abundantly clear was that every time I went out to, to talk to someone about the delegation framework, we started usually with one question, and that was, how will this work within integrated services? How will it work at the sharp end of the tool? And the sharp end of the tool was generally, if I'm honest, direct payments and self-directed support issues. And, um, and so I, I arrived and said, here's this lovely framework and this is how it works. And I had hardly the word, that sentence out of my mouth before the question started. And so it is almost easier, I think, to start with where we are in relation to the sharp end of the tool and what we're doing about it to, I think, probably allay anxieties and concerns around that particular area of practice. And I think this slide probably portrays this very well. You should always know where you're going to finish before <laughs> you actually start something. Um, and on this occasion, I can't say that we knew that the issues were there, but what we did in the nursing and midwifery uh, framework, and my colleague, uh, Angela McLaren, who is the chief executive of NIPEC, very um, skillfully and intelligently suggested that we have uh, Colin Conway, who was the then chief executive of NISC, um, he's now moved to a post in England, um, he co-chaired the nursing and midwifery work. And why was that helpful? Well, that, that meant that our social work partners had a very clear understanding of what was happening in nursing. He brought the social work voice and contributed in uh, to our, our meetings and was um, very, very helpful in terms of understanding the complexities for our social work colleagues and social care. And that allowed us then to flush out the three extra pieces of work that we needed to um, go forward and do something about, uh, uh, as well as then establishing a framework for nursing and midwifery in Northern Ireland. So next slide, please, Resty. So you can see on the screen there, we have four pillars, if you like, of work. Um, one of them is done, so the first pillar, so nurse, midwife to whomever, the decision support to is completed. That's what I have brought to you today, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we have three other pieces that we need to unpick, and currently Bob um, sits on a um, steering group, or a, it's um, called a, a project assurance group, for a governance framework that will allow each of the professions involved in delivering services to understand how a delegation arrangement can be set up between professions in a way that allows feedback to go to the right profession and for issues to be picked up appropriately. So that if something um, ends up in a triad for the sake of argument between nursing and social care, social slash social work, that the line for escalating any concerns or issues around the healthcare, the nursing task or duty, goes back up through nursing. And it's my understanding that in some instances this is working well, but on the whole it's not. And again, the sharp end of the tool is direct payments and self-directed support, and indeed to understand some of the complexities around that, we commissioned an evidence review back in, uh, which was reported on in September of last year. So, message from that, I want to reassure you that we know these issues are there, 
there are issues around where nurses are training other people um, and they may not necessarily need to be there. We're in a global downturn. Why would nursing be in training people that they have no reason to be training and there is no need for them to be training? So we're, we're doing a bit of head scratching around that and challenging some of the, the thinking. Um, it may be the right place for them to be, but we also want to take a step back and say, well, actually, is it? Could we use that nurse better somewhere else? And, and then finally, the user or carer element, delegating a task or duty to a parent, to a carer, to someone who is employed under direct payments or self-directed support. How does that all work, given that it's public money? And particularly in the SDS and DPs, how are the governance arrangements set up that a trust who is still vicariously liable for the money and how it's being sent, spent, um, how can a trust be assured that the governance arrangements are in place to enable those concerns to be escalated. So I'm going to pause there and forgive me, hopefully this doesn't take too much of the discussion away. Is, are you content with that explanation? Are there any comments or questions? I'm very, my background being paediatrics and a number of the children are complex care, they've now transitioned over to adult services so I've been very much an interface of why we need to try and crack this one and I've been there in 2015 when we raised this yeah. and it's frustrating that we still haven't yet cracked, it may take quite a bit more. One of the areas that we did succeed in our court, or was our award, is that we had our own education team, some practice education, practice education staff, whatever type you want to give them, who then overseen the training, the competencies, the reviewing of it, and um, we did that with the parents, we did that with the direct payment carers who came in, and as we, we always said at regional meetings, look, we don't know this direct payments, some one of our trusts probably will become a trust, you know, a court case someday that will test out why are we using direct payments? But you know, we're 10, 15 years down the line from that. You know, I think we we can risk assess, and we risk assess to death, I suppose, uh, for the right reasons. And we have delegated what we would consider to be quite complex. I think there's good governance arrangements in and around it. Going forward, though, moving this into the adult world, where there is more the domiciliary care, I think we have big challenges that maybe we've so much of it contracted out, and whether there's room for us to bring more of that back in and develop our own training team internally and continue to support that way because I think if we have that team who, and we know who is out there doing it, I just fear that people are risk averse and want to keep their hands off us all the time and just say it's nursing, it's nursing and the only can do it is nursing staff and I'm very keen to push forward for the social care part of it to be involved. Yes, get the governance parts of it right. And we can't make it a blanket rule because you can look at a task and say that kind of task is that one to be delegated. It might be fit to be delegated in one very stable location, but it's very unreliable in others. So you know, I don't like having lists to say that task can be delegated and that it's suddenly up there that you can delegate giving insulin. Well, it's not, but it may. And that was what our test case was back in 2015, was a young person. Complex. You know, he, he was getting it from the school staff during the day, and that was also their care assistant in the evening, and why they couldn't get it from the same care who was deep during the day. So it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the ones in the, in the yes, campaign for moving it up to stage four. So, uh, Mary, you, you picked out, I mean, there, uh, I am not sure that I'm able to retain all of the points that you made there, so I'm, I'm going to, in no particular order, as they say. Um, I think fundamentally, um, for me, this project, along with, and I've brought both with me, I've brought the enabling professionalism framework with me, and I've brought the delegation framework with me, and for me, I can't recall, um, with the exception of record keeping, a project which has flushed out um, understanding what it is that nurses do that is distinct to any other profession in any other way. And I'm speaking mainly about nursing because actually midwifery have it pretty much cracked in terms of the mid midwifery support worker and they've gone down the road of lists and what is delegable and what isn't. Um, nursing, that's not possible. And actually whenever um, 
Charlotte uh, invited me to her office and her exact words were to me, Angela, just sort of like for me please, will you? Uh, so no pressure. <laughs> and that was the short and the long of the commission. Um, so uh, um, the complexity of nursing is vast. Some of it is buried in, if dare I say, the ability to articulate what it is that nurses do that are, is distinct <coughs> to other professions so that you know whether or not it is actually a nursing task or duty. Um, in terms of the interfaces, absolutely, and red lines, whenever Charlotte said sort of out, she at that stage really felt that in the best interests of the professions, probably a list was a good idea, and I could understand why she was going there, and, I, and still with the awareness sessions, we would still get the idea that we need a list. Um, that very example that you cited there, which is on a particular day, for someone who is trained for a particular person, understanding that individual within a plan of care, currently it is correct, the next day it might not be, depending on the condition. So I think it's very difficult to give a red line, and that's not what we've done, and Charlotte has listened to the arguments and is fully accepting of the approach that we've taken, actually has welcomed the approach that we've taken, which is we have provided a decision support tool for nurses and midwives to critically think through their own decisions based on the person and the, the person that they are delegating to and understanding that there is a nursing and midwife or midwifery plan of care and position. And so the two that you have should enable those conversations to happen. Sorry, Garrett. Yeah, there's just a quick com comment that, as well. Angela and I know that the challenge is that you're articulating from a registered nurse's mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. Um, I suppose within our code, we have a unique um, responsibility under delegation that some of the other professions don't we understand. Do. You're absolutely right. And that is specific around the registered nurses responsible for the outcome of that delegation. Yeah. And that's why social workers and some other um, professions actually don't get why we are so yes. um, almost obsessional about this and in our desire to get this right. Yeah. And we are responsible for the outcome of that delegation. Correct. Correct. And the presentation will demonstrate that um, later on. I suppose I'm going to move on now because I'm conscious of her time. Um, Resty, next slide, please. <coughs> um, so, uh, what delegation is, and we're going to pick up on Garrett's point there. Um, uh, um, the delegator remains accountable for the overall management of practice, and actually, under the code, uh, we are responsible for the outcome of care. So, if you as a nurse, or a midwife have prescribed a plan of care for the person in your care, then you are, it is your responsibility and you are accountable for ensuring that whatever actions um, go along with that plan of care uh, in order to advance the person's outcomes, you are responsible for confirming that they have been carried out to the standard that you would expect and that the outcomes have actually been achieved. And that's in the code. There's a very small section on delegation in the code um, and uh, that is very, very clearly in that small section in the code that uh, around your responsibility as a registrant. Next slide, please, um, Resty. Uh, just to say that um, this framework is specific to nurses and midwives. Now, could it be used for other professions? Absolutely, because they can, they can think with their own evidence base. Another profession could come along use this decision support tool and use their own evidence base of their profession to think critically think through the decision. But the decision support tool is still useful. So it, it may well be used, and we haven't explored this, but if we were approached by other professions to use this tool uh, in, in a, in a multi-professional way, we'd be open to discussing that. But primarily at this moment in time, it is for nurses and midwives and for nurses and midwives in Northern Ireland, so it hasn't spread anywhere else. But um, suffice to say that almost on a weekly basis, we're getting contact to the office in NIPEC asking, could we speak about it to other jurisdictions in the UK, or um, could they lift it and use it? Could they, you know? So um, other people are seeing the value at this moment in time. Um, there are delegatees, so anybody that you are delegating to 
we feel should lift and, and read this framework. So it's not just about nurses and midwives, it's other people in your team. And we established late on, um, this was a to and and froing for, uh, with the NMC, but we did establish that actually this is also from registrant to registrant. There may be occasions whenever a registered nurse or midwife may delegate to another registrant and within the context of care that's entirely appropriate, but where that happens, whether it's when it's delegation as opposed to allocation of care, then the same responsibilities, the responsibilities for delegation um, do exist from registrant to registrant. So um, obviously it's for all nurses and midwives and then those people that you're delegating to. But there are also implications for employers in Northern Ireland and also the public because, um, dare I say it, I'm not sure that every person that we're caring for in the system understands what's happening in a complex decision around delegation and yet we should be seeking their consent for those decisions and uh, it should be a co-producing uh, decision in the same way that their plan of care, whenever you're uh, describing their plan of care, that should be a co-produced um, action as well. So next slide please, Resting. The framework itself, um, if, if I, we tried to do this in a 3D way but it was too messy graphically, but if I'd had my way I would have built this uh, like one of those, you know those children's rings that sit, sit with a, you know, the plastic bit up the middle, I would have built it like that where the context of care, so the contextual arrangements are sitting on the bottom ring really supporting everything understanding, and I'll, I'm going to go to this in, in a minute, uh, that the context of care is extremely important for making good decisions around delegation, then the registrant themselves has to understand what they are accountable for and what they're responsible for, and the delegatee and employing organisation need to understand what everyone is accountable for and what everyone's responsible for. So accountability and responsibility are the next ring, if you like, that support the delegation decision. And then the final ring is around the actual decision-making process. So the right task, and some of you will be familiar with this, this is not um, unique to NIPEC. We've changed some of the wording around it. Um, so the right task, the right circumstance, the right person, the right direction, and the right supervision and evaluation. And that's about confirming the very central bit, which is that you're achieving your person-centered outcomes. So next slide, please, Resty. So just very briefly, the context principles, there are three, uh, and there are many, many more elements described in the framework, so I'm not going to focus on, on the entirety of what they say uh, this morning, but suffice to say they're there in the framework and they are important. And we find that from the evidence, uh, to, to use a very easy one to access that all of you will be acutely aware of, if you don't have the right number of people providing care in your service environments, there is a likelihood or a predisposition that decisions regarding the delegation of tasks and duties within the nursing midwifery family will happen that may not necessarily be appropriate. And that's about not enough people and having to spread uh, what it is that we're doing. And you may be indeed um, challenged to think in a new way uh, because of resourcing or because of actual ability to get people in and to retain them. But this now provides you with the parlance and a framework to challenge back and say, well, no, actually, we're not going to delegate that task or duty, and here's why, here's our thinking. And you can set your decision out according to the framework itself. So next slide, please, Resting. Um, so other issues around the importance of context include uh, the likes of policies and procedures. So um, job descriptions have to have the opportunity to have these tasks and duties delegated. So you can't delegate it to someone who doesn't have that element of care in their job description. And you need to be clear about what's available and what's not available in the organisation. And indeed the process for raising and escalating concerns. And that filters through all of the rings of the um, framework, if you like. It's a, a constituent part or a golden thread that works the whole way through that people understand who they need to go to if they're not happy. So next slide please, Resty, and we'll go to the next one. I'm just conscious of her time. Um, so I've talked a bit about uh, this, the um, uh, context of care. I think if we go to the next slide we'll talk a bit about accountability and responsibility. Yep. Yeah. So um, there are obvious, there are differences around accountability and responsibility and what you're accountable for and what you're responsible for are slightly different and the framework encourages registrants to think about 
what it means to be accountable and what it means to be responsible. And actually, if I'm honest, I think our registrants probably have a good understanding. They maybe can't articulate it uh, precisely, but they are aware that they're accountable. I think <coughs> perhaps, dare I say, where the gap is, is for those people that we are delegating to could potentially not fully understand what they're accountable for and what they're responsible for. And so I think um, this is a good opportunity to have those conversations and to use the framework to have the conversations. Next slide, please, Resty. And the next slide. So um, the final component then is around the right task, the right circumstance, the right person, the right direction, and the, the right support and evaluation. And if we move to the next slide, um, Resty. <coughs> Whenever we were putting the decision framework together, we knew that we were going to have to help people critically think through the questions in their head that would lead them as eventually to having a, a good decision around the delegation, uh, practice of delegation. And in many, on many occasions, so Arsha and I were talking about this in the car on the way up, for, for acute areas, it's reasonably straightforward on many occasions to make a decision around delegation because you're actually in the environment, you can see the outcome of care, you can see what somebody's doing, you're almost supervising them, you know, you're in the area, you can rescue anything that goes wrong very quickly. Um, so, it, so in those instances, it may well be the delegation happens and it happens intuitively. Um, there's a plan of care and it's understood who will be doing it and it's very clear from the record in the acute area who's delivering what, etc, etc. I think the trickier part then comes in the community environments and what we are saying is in the framework um, you must be able to give an account of why you've taken a decision to delegate a, um, a, a task or duty and have evidence to support that. And sessions that we've run before, it's become very clear that the framework helps that thinking and actually helps the articulation. So in the plan of nursing care, and if we move on to the, the next slide then, Resty, the plan of nursing care and before you use um, the decision support matrix, you must demonstrate that you have considered the elements of the matrix and that the plan of nursing care then affords the opportunity for delegation of particular tasks. <coughs> And um, I think we will get to a much better place whenever we start to, this comes second nature to us, that we're articulating it in the, the patient record and the nursing care record. So finally, if we move to the decision support matrix then, which is the next slide, please, Resty. Now, this isn't the clear slide here on the screen, but it is in, in, in the <coughs> books that I've brought up to you today. There are um, eight, elements of risk, areas of risk, uh, questions around areas of risk, and they're structured under three domains of risk. Um, and the questions are linked to, for example, the condition of the person. So going back to um, the example that you were providing, Mary, earlier on, uh, where the condition of, of an individual uh, that we're caring for is very stable. Um, it may be easy to predict the outcome, it may be easy to predict how the care plan will run, um, but for an individual who is very has a brittle condition or who is very unstable, the predictability is very greatly reduced, and so there needs to be a, con a consideration of either can you put something in a position that allows um, a decision-making tree or a decision-making process that enables the delegatee to make those decisions, but within a very structured um, um, algorithm or is it just not doable as the condition of the individual is so brittle that actually there's a, a great degree of critical thinking um, a nurse using his or her skills um, and critical thinking and evidence base to think through what they're going to do for that person on a day and daily basis and so therefore it cannot be delegated so the matrix affords people the opportunity to think all of that through. It's reasonably straightforward in that you answer each of the questions in each of the domains. Um, if they're all green, you're good to go, you can delegate. Um, and indeed, um, in the more complex environment, if they're all green, I would suggest you still need to write down why you know, you're, you've made this choice. Um, if there is one of the questions answered in the amber box, 
then there may be mitigating interventions that you can put in place, such as maybe training for the delegatee or um, a decision support tool within a very um, confined space of decisions that they could follow. If this happens, then you do this. If this happens, you do this. But there is not really any critical thinking involved or assessment processes. It's simply watching what is happening in person and observing. And then finally, um, and if you can do that, then that moves it into the green. Um, but if there are any of the questions, any one single of the questions that you ever in the day framework, as in the decision that you make on Monday the 1st of April or um, Tuesday the 2nd of April lasts until Monday the 1st of April 2020. This has to be constantly under review because the people that we care for constantly change. So uh, a, a decision of delegation is something that you will need to use your professional judgment around in terms of how frequently you review it. And I suppose I very often, and I omitted to do, I often start with that. Delegation is very much a matter of professional judgment and that's why there are no red lines. You are an autonomous practitioner, our nurses and midwives are autonomous practitioners, and they have the skills and abilities to think through what is right for the people in their care. And I suppose I, I'm quite proud of this framework because we're starting to have these conversations again about recognising the autonomous practice of our nurses and midwives and the ability to do that and to sharpen the focus and the lens on what it is and what the contribution of nursing and midwifery is to the lives of the people that we care for. So next slide please resting. We were asked to do a number of examples um, through the testing phase. Uh, our colleagues were saying, look, could you just set out a few examples of what you mean, what you mean, how it might be articulated in terms of our, our plan of care. Um, just give us a few pointers. So we've set three examples out. They are limited uh, in terms of their scope because there are only three examples. There are only three vignettes of care. Um, we are developing our website at the minute and um, hopefully this film will be uploaded to the website um, at a point in time. And we will add other films to it as well. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is develop more examples. So we're always looking for um, complex examples of care where you've used the decision framework to drive your thinking. So please get in touch if you've got a really good example. And we'll probably continue to populate the, the website and demonstrate those examples, obviously anonymizing them for, for both trust and practitioner and patient. Uh, but we, we feel that that's a really useful thing to do. Um, and so we'll continue to grow that resource. Next slide. Um, Resty, so uh, what now? So, um, and there's a further slide if you just go on to the next slide over here. We're developing the resources. So, next slide. Um, and the slide after that. And the slide after that. <laughs> We're developing the resources on the website. Um, the document is available, but I've brought you hard copies. We also would like, um, and we're searching for the money to do some animations around uh, exemplifying. So we did we did that with enabling professionalism, and it would be great if we were able to do the same thing because we have a range of generations that work within nursing, and uh, different people respond to different things. Some people like hard copy, some people read it online, some people will respond well to the animation style. So we want to offer a range of learning and support resources. Um, and um, finally, the next stage in terms of what we are doing is the phase two work that Bob is involved in and that governance structure. How that will work is that the governance uh, structure will be at a principal level, so you should be able to plug and play any of your delegation frameworks. And we know that our social work colleagues have a, an OSS circular out, which was published on the 19th of January of this year, that will guide our social work colleagues. Um, high and ever, all of those frameworks should sit below this overarching <coughs> governance framework which will guide uh, each of the professions in how those relationships, those professional relationships are set up and how concerns can be escalated appropriately if they should arise. So um, that's me done. Um, thank you for your attention. I'm slightly over time. Sorry, apologies Bob. Um, <coughs> and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you Angela. And, um just uh, check with, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting feedback, uh, check with Adrian and Raven and Amanda, any, any comments? Uh. And then, it's over to you, Raven, is there any comments or questions for answer, please? Can I just say, I want, Angela, we've tried to set up a panel here within the Trust to try and look at this and we've looked at some of the cases already and very oh. complex. And again, a lot of them to do with the social care and the delegation to um, 
uh, you know, either agency staff yeah. or um, our own trust staff as well, or outside through the agencies. And again, because the trust is like two different systems going, one through Mary, and what Mary has already progressed and moved on, yeah. and the children's and adults, this is where we're trying to do the catch up. But again, it would be interesting to see. Um, we've had some complex cases that I probably will send to you yes, to see if you agree with our decisions on it. <laughs> yes. um, because we do feel that we have to move this forward yeah. as yeah. well. And we are probably taking a risk at the minute and stepping outside because we're probably sitting at number four mm -hmm. on your chart yes. with a lot of them yes. where we're making with the social care and the SDS yeah. at the minute. So again, I'd be interested just in your feedback as well and what you think about us at the minute of they get delegating some of those tasks to agency staff as well. Safer for what Mary's doing and ideally they had the practice educator with the whole team. Yeah, so um, it is a very complex area Donna and I appreciate and you're absolutely right and you're not on your own mm -hmm. um, uh, is what I would say. All of the trusts are struggling with this. Mm -hmm. um, so the round table event that we had in September of last year and Bob attended it, um, really the, there was palpable anxiety in the room uh, across both social work and nursing and we had all of the directors of uh, the, all of the executive directors of nursing executive directors of social work across the trusts and the directors of adult care um, who were nurses or social workers were all in the room and indeed we had some of our children's um, executive or directors <coughs> there as well so um, uh, <coughs> this is something that keeps people awake at night and we know this um, so we know that everyone is functioning in a bit of a vacuum at the minute, the trust may have policies, I suppose. Now the evidence review is actually on our website, so it, it's in the public domain. Uh, please feel free to go and have a look at that evidence review. There are broad principles that were flushed out um, of that evidence review around um, what would be necessary in a governance framework. We have a bit more work to do around a further evidence review. Um, relating to multi-professional practice because that evidence re review was just specific to direct payments in SDS. Yeah. Um, so we have another bit of work to do which we're, we're doing at the minute. We're going to marry all of that up. We think that it will provide broad principles. Now where does that bump into the agency piece? The independent <coughs> and voluntary sector are waking up at the minute to what we're doing and um, indeed some of the agencies in Belfast have employed a nurse in the agency, understanding that that triad needs to be in place, and that if you're, if we're commissioning care as the health and social care system from an independent body, and we're handing over the responsibility, albeit, um, you know, it's still trust money that's being handed over, and we know from Don Murray Manor that, um, you know, that's a complex area, that the contractual arrangements are a complex area, but. So I, I believe, um, and hopefully I'll, I'll be right, that the context, albeit a very difficult context, and the learning from Dunmurray, has actually put us in a really good place to have a discussion around what needs to be the overarching principles, and when we are thinking about the contractual arrangements, what are the responsibilities of that agency that enable the totality of the contractual arrangements to be um, suitably placed in a governance framework that means everybody can sleep at night in their bed. And, um, and, and I hope that we will get to a broad set of principles that will be equally applicable to not only the statutory sector but the independent and voluntary sector and to that end I, I see that playing out because we are getting agencies in Belfast who are putting a lead nurse in knowing that where there is a health care, where there is a nursing task, where there is a nursing care plan that's being handed over for a client, <coughs> that they have to have somebody in the loop who can oversee that nursing care plan. And that provides some reassurance that the messages then for me that we are getting, we're putting out in the public domain, is, are being picked up and actually listened to. And not only that, but <coughs> some future thinking around what they need to do as organisations to make sure that they've got the people in place to um, to have that governance arrangements that the, 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 the trusts will sign off and be happy to contractually. I don't know, we have some direct uh, experience. That's how much they were better than they will have to move on. Sure okay. We have some experience of that locally in the trust and, and as Donna alluded to, other pieces of work and I think you know over this through Bernie Ladies where we're trying to yeah. merge yeah. what 
is coming through uh, the delegation framework here and what's come from social care. Yeah. Because the big area of whilst there are challenges in what you've described, the self-directed support is presenting probably more of the scary things going yeah. all of those controls. Yeah. Even when you get the independent sector engaged, that doesn't happen with the self-directed support. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's I, I see it as three layers really in, yes. in the sense of where we're going with that. Yeah, I, no, I, I appreciate that, Brendan. Um, and it may well be that there's still a bit more flushing to do. You know, we reckon that those three pillars probably broadly represent where the, the issues are, um, the <coughs> final pillars. Uh, but it may well be that there are some latent issues that we've not yet considered that might need to be flushed out. And you're absolutely right. Um, I think the interfaces of care as well, the transitions from children's service to adult services are a difficult area as well um, in terms of what's happening around <coughs> SDS. So yeah, there's still there's a huge amount of work still to be done, but um, uh, bear with us. We're, we're doing our best and hopefully we'll get there. So thank you very okay. much, Bob. Uh,